Lori, do you know, you say that they've changed the way they're doing the bills. Why are they, why do you think it's changed? Uh, I, I, if I had to guess, I would say that the Premier needed to have something in her hand because there was no sign uh, of the last two bills that we went out on, last three bills we went out on. Um, they weren't um, described. The children's bill was touched on as a hope for some time in the next year. And there it was coming through in all of its not completed glory. Um, so I think they needed to give the Premier something to have in her hand on the barbecue circuit, and they had nothing, she had nothing to go away with. Um, and each new day they were in there gave the opposition a fresh opportunity to expand on our alternatives. It was just a scandal a day, and you know all we had to do was get up in the morning and show up, and there was our work. Uh, it was easy to react to um, because they were just doing so badly. So one, they wanted out of here really fast, uh, and two, they needed to give her something to have in her hand on the on the barbecue circuit. So she's now got a children's first bill. Uh, they've managed to, um, I think, reoffend the teachers, um, but also uh, rile up uh, the unions, the public service unions to come. Anyone that's thinking of negotiating a contract coming up, I think they were supposed to receive a message, um, being that if you don't cooperate, your bill will just be legislated through, your contract will just be legislated. Um, we'll see what the reaction of people uh, other than the community is to that. And Dean Redford has essentially been governing by decree. Um, everything she wants, she bulldozes through the legislature. And really the behavior of the Premier and the government, first they showed up three weeks late, they're leaving three weeks early. She had many absences when the Premier was in the legislature, she wouldn't answer any questions. And, and this is just not becoming of a leader and a Premier. Actually, I have something about absences. Very interrupted. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I have started to track, and we might have something we can give you by the end. Oh, we can. We have something we can give you right now. Um, I started to notice how many ministerial absences there were every day. Now, this should not be a surprise to anybody. The government has called us to sit. The one rule for MLAs, for elected people in this province, is when the session is in, you must show up. And you have to have a reason that you give in advance to the speaker if you're not going to be there. And every day I would look across and see great gaping, the great gaping maw of absent ministers. And not they weren't traveling as they used to under Stelmack, where they just, you know, got out there book of the world and decided where they wanted to go for a conference, they're gone. Uh, and almost without exception, when there was a terrible scandal to do with the minister one day, the next day they were not in question period. Uh, and that's, we're still tracking some of those details, but when you look at how many of them didn't show up on a regular basis, that's, that's pretty bad. Especially when it's the one rule that we have to follow is show up. Uh, and every day we're looking at five, six, seven, eight ministers missing a day. And they only have 23, 24, I've missed, I've lost count. Uh, they changed the departments around. So that's a pretty bad average to have people missing. And interestingly, more than once, it was the important portfolios that you want to be talking about. Energy, environment, health, finance. So it's the big ones. And that can really be a difficulty for the opposition who's looking, trying to create craft questions and looks at, at our absence list and goes, oh, we can't ask that question, they're not there. We can't ask that question, they're not there. All right, let's try and rewrite this to ask questions of those that are left. That's pretty bad. It seemed like, especially in the context, but it seemed to me like the government business seemed to be getting a little bit more politicized in the last year. <clears throat> Specifically, they're, they're, the, the, uh, the uh, questions from the government backbenchers to the ministers seem to be a little bit more of a partisan tone. We're seeing Redford government and government news releases. Even the bills now, student assurance bill, children first bill. Am I missing that or do you see, uh, no. is there a trend of politicization of government business here? Yeah, I really see the politicization of, of government. I see them moving the politics from outside of this building, inside of this building. 
uh, and more than that, moving it into the assembly. So we had backbenchers posing puffball questions with an attack on uh, the main, the official opposition in it, so that the government could stand up and answer the question back by taking a run at the official opposition. Now, parliamentary process says that ministers have a choice when asked a question. They can not answer it, they can answer it, they can say, I don't know and I'll get back to you, or they can say, I'm not going to answer it, right? That's it. It doesn't say anywhere in any parliamentary book, well, I can take this opportunity to run down uh, a member of the opposition or uh, you know, to call someone out or to insult them. None of that is in parli parliamentary process. So yes, it's getting very political. The other thing I see a lot is what I call tourniquet questions. Am I using the right? right tourniquet. Tourniquet, tourniquet. thank you. Um, for staunching the flow of blood. So where there's been a scandal or something that the opposition has brought up the day before uh, and it's hurt them, the next day you will see a backbencher asking a question exactly on that so that they can get up and staunch the flow of blood that's gushing out uh, in order to try and uh, give their spin on the, on the answer. Um, you know, sometimes they should just answer the question. It's not that hard. They spend more effort not answering the question than it would take to actually answer it. But it's very political in there. And the names of the bills are political, so the language is very... Um, the language is very specific. The school, the student's assurance bill, which... Um, I didn't put too fine a point on it when I called it the whack the teacher's bill because that's what it's about. Um, they meant to whack the teachers of the school boards and tell them to behave. Um, the Children's First Act, if I was a child in Alberta that was under government care, by the time I'm an adult I think I would be pretty angry with them. They have given themselves permission to dig into my personal uh, health information and all kinds of other pers personal information of me as a ward of the government and trade it around am amongst unknown organizations and frankly undefined organizations. And as an adult, I can't find out who had that information, what information they had, get access to it to correct it because sometimes it's opinion or observations and if you had a bad day and someone made an observation that you're not um, very open to suggestion, that'll be in your file. And as an adult, that stuff's out there. And now you're trying to get social service benefits or register your, register your kid in a program, and that information is being held by the government. And twice this government has used the <coughs> information it collected for one purpose, for another purpose. And that is wrong, according to what we have under uh, protection of privacy information. So. That's a very long answer to your short question, sorry. So they, they focus a lot on spin. Even if you look at the Public Affairs Bureau, uh, they've been guilty of doing a lot of spin, but now it's become all about the Redford government. Mm -hmm. They've politicized the messaging of the Public Affairs Bureau. Now that's taxpayer-funded money, really, to promote just Redford and her government and why she was elected. Secondly, um, you know, it's, Roy, what did we say? Uh, it's like an oligarchy, uh, uh, autocratic? Yes. Very autocratic way of governing and very oligarchical way of governing. And, and, you know, that's just not appropriate in a well, truly functioning, well functioning democracy. Redford not only has disdain for any opposition parties or the legislature itself, but she really has disdain for any organization that stands up to her. Whether it's corrections officers, whether it's teachers, school boards, municipal uh, uh, leaders, anyone that stands up to her, she actually has disdain for them. And that's just not right for a premier of such a great province. Laura, can you give an example of, uh, in your words, a perceived scandal um, and then the relevant minister missing the next day? Uh, not off the top of my head, but I'll get it for you. Thanks. Oh, well, yeah, maybe it doesn't have, yeah. You know what, let me go back and look and then I'll sure. be able to get you something very specific because yeah. I was noticing it in my head but I wasn't writing it down and I know it happened so I'll get that for you. 
The Premier is going to be speaking at 1.30. I am confident she's going to tell us that the session was an incredible success. They did pass a lot of legislation compared to the fall sitting. They did their environment, you know, their uh, energy regulation funding, the weather. So, I mean, do you really think that, is it fair to call it a disaster compared to the fall session? I think it's just weak. Um, when you consider that the last bill we had was Bill 26, and we've been in three sittings for this, last spring, which was admittedly short, the fall, and this spring. Normally, we'd be into the 50s, easily. Uh, so we're not getting a lot of substantial legislation. The first pieces of legislation, you remember, were um, bringing in the RCMP under the Health Care Act. It was a lot of very minor, um, often important, but administrative work. Um, and then at the very end, you get the big stuff, and it goes through really fast. And the government has used um, parliamentary process that I have never seen used, where it can now advance uh, more than one stage in a day for a reading of a bill. What does that mean? There are rules in the parliament that you must spend a certain amount of time, one day, on each stage of the bill, second read, first reading, second reading, etc. It's to give enough time for everyone to read the bill, do some research, think about it, and come forward to debate it. So when you start combining those and saying, we're gonna do first, second, and committee of the whole today, and, the, and you haven't seen the bill, you've never read the bill, that, that's a problem. And it's meant to make sure that nobody else gets to comment on it. We don't get to talk to stakeholders. You can imagine putting out a phone call at 3 o'clock in the afternoon saying, I've just seen this act. Can someone give me a reaction? You can't get hold of people. And you've gone through the, the stage where you could have made amendments before people come to work the next morning. And Sarah, that's the whole point. To have so much legislation, and if it's such important legislation, we came in three weeks late into the ledge, left three weeks early, passing bills under cover of, cover of darkness at 3, 4 in the morning. Um, if it's that important, it requires debate on the floor of the legislature. It require, requires good critique. And when opposition parties offer amendments to the bills, and we, we agree with many of the things that need to be done, but we can simply make them better. To stifle debate, which is, is to stifle democracy. And that's why we question if Redford thought these were so important, why did she, didn't she give them an e opportunity to be fairly and openly debated? She shoved them down the throat of Albertans, and now she's going to go consult with them and uh, to th tell them why it's good for them. That's simply not how you govern. Rush, talking about the barbecue circuit, what's the plan for you in uh, the summer in terms of uh, recruiting people to the party, changing policy? What? What's on the agenda? Well, the plan for us, Dean, we have an AGM coming on, coming up on June 15th uh, in Edmonton. And uh, we're in the party rebuilding phase. Uh, it started a couple, about a year ago, shortly after the election. Um, we're in a membership drive, and we're getting out to town halls. I had a good town hall in Metal Arts starting off a couple of weeks ago. We had about 52 people out. And we're basically taking the budget it's actually a pretty apolitical town hall. So here's your money, where it comes from, here's where it's going, here are the issues, question and answer, no holds barred, and uh, we're getting very good feedback. So my plan is to get out from town hall to town hall, community to community, you know, we're talking to real people about what's important to them. I'm gonna sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a few days, and uh, yeah then I, we go back into our constituencies because that's where our questions come from, that's where the issues come from, that's the way we do our work. We should be digging it out of, no offense to you, but I'd really rather not follow the media, I'd rather dig the good stuff out of the constituency and there's lots of stuff there. Um, and I'm getting some uh, really interesting feedback. I'm getting more and more emails every day that say, okay, I made a mistake. I voted for the, for the Redford Conservatives because I thought I needed to stop the Wild Rose, and I wish I hadn't done that. You're getting a large arena, I think, in your constituency. <laughs> I am, indeed, further revitalization of the fabulous constituency of Edmonton Centre. So what are, you, what are you hearing about that? You know, um, 
my constituents have very strong views on this. Uh, a number of the older people living there were quite concerned about uh, any impact on their tax dollars because they don't have, um, uh, it's a fixed income that they're on, so if they have to pay more in tax, that's less of something else. Um, we're not supposed to be using tax dollars, so as long as that's okay, they're okay with the arena. Um, and the downtown community league was quite excited about the possibilities. My job was to make sure that the Cates Group and City Council actually listen to the people that live there because it, it's our front lawn. It looks to you like a sidewalk on 104th Street. To us, it's our front lawn. And so how do we deal with thousands of people emptying out of that arena? Those were the sort of issues that we were concerned about. So a consultation with the community and plans about how all of that was going to be dealt with and having the building be uh, not an edifice, uh, not an obelisk, something that had doors and windows and you could see people activity in it and people were coming and going, a friendly building in other words. Um, so those were the concerns and if those are met, we're good to go. Anything else guys? Has there been any talk among the parties about changing question period in any way? Limiting the number of backbench? Uh... Every year. <laughs> I, Do you think that, that, like, is it substantive? Is it just you asking for changes, or is there any sympathy on the government side? Or, I mean, a, like, is it an honest discussion or something that you want? <clears throat> well, honest I from would the have said that I honestly wanted it. Uh, every year, I prepare uh, a, a parliamentary argument about why this is inappropriate, uh, and I have done uh, the, the the scan across the country and even in other countries. Yes, um, other uh, provinces and other countries do allow government backbenchers to ask questions, but I cannot find any example where they ask more than three. And at this point, we have almost as many backbencher questions being asked as questions from the official opposition. So there has been a steady limiting, a steady rigidity, a steady narrowing of um, parliamentary process that is available that protects opposition. And um, I'm, I'm ready to go with the shorter opposition if we can get rid of uh, the backbencher questions. And I, I don't really want to do that. I've always been an advocate for um, private members, which includes the opposition and the backbenchers, but this isn't playing fair. Um, and it's, it's deliberate to make sure that we cannot hold them accountable because we don't get enough questions to be able to dig and get the answers out. You need a, a run of three or four questions to start to dig it out of somebody and get them to open up and give you the answers. And we can't get that. We're deliberately <clears throat> broken up. So it's not only the number, but it's the positioning of how the questions work. But is there any sympathy that you detect from the government to make any kind of change at all? Uh, no. As I said, there is less uh, less openness to that and more rigidity. Okay. Uh, they're just not entertaining it. They're not entertaining anything. Um, you know, I could usually manage to get an extra question period out of them, which would have been today. Um, not doing it. Paul, the, having been an ex-government member, it's really a bit of a joke, this process. Uh, when government caucus meets, uh, the ministers say, hey, who wants to answer the, ask this question? And then someone who hasn't been on the public record, they really don't have a big interest in the area, they'll ask it because they want to get on the public record. The answer is scripted and the question is scripted. Half the time the ministers, most of the time, are actually just reading the answer of a sheet of paper. Many times they would be reading it off like this. Now at least they have the courtesy of keeping on the desk. This is a joke. It's a ridiculous joke. Government backbenchers have that opportunity at caucus to challenge their ministers and ask government. They have enough opportunities uh, to spin whatever they want through the, through the Public Affairs Bureau or through their respective ministries. But to do this on the floor of the legislature is just absolutely ridiculous. I think we should have a no paper day. No written questions, no written answers. Let's see how we all do on our feet. I'd like to see the government ministers answer questions asked to them without written paper, without having to read them. Let's see if they actually know something about the ministry. Now that'd be fun. Okay. And Thanks on so. that note... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you